lesson together sometime back last January. I have never, I've never give it to anybody. Um, I know that that where I was preaching in Huntsville, there's a lot of people having a crisis, and of course, you know, there's uh, people around here that have a crisis. And I wanna, I wanna talk to you today about um, God doing the impossible. Sometimes. Sometimes it seems that um, that we're, we get to a place in life where trials, especially those that Satan sends um, or is able to do, what, whatever comes through God's protective shields, there's some things that just seem like that there's just no way around it. That it just seems like you've got a problem that, that you just can't fix. But I remind everyone that Jesus said... The things that are impossible for people to do are possible for God to do. And I'm going to ask you to consider the possibility that nothing is impossible with God and He's still on the job. Um, we go to a place sometimes uh, with, with our legalistic background. Uh, we, we're very comfortable with, with shutting things and building boxes for God and expecting God to operate in those boxes. And people get excited sometimes when when you begin to consider that God will operate outside the box they built for Him to operate in. And they don't want to consider that. They, they start to, to cast uh, uh, doubt and talk about the harm it would do to believe certain things or to believe that God would help you. You know, that people ask for help and don't get it so they're disappointed and, and they might not come back to church. All kinds of just ignorant arguments will come from that. And... Um, and so what we want to do is we want to look at, uh, at just this kind of will be an introductory study to some things I want to talk about because a lot of my life is right now. Um, a lot of my life is centered around trying to see what God wants me to do, what His will for me is while I'm having trials. And so I want to, I want to know the question I have in my mind, okay, it's like Paul. He paid three times. He prayed three times for for uh, what was sent against him to stop. And you know we try to make a bigger deal out of that than what it is. The Bible actually says what his problem was. There was a messenger of Satan that was allowed to torment him. He tells us what it was, and we have that too. That there are, there are demons that that are allowed to torment you. There is an area that they're allowed to torment. And you have a level of protection. Everyone does. But it's not forever that, that they're allowed or permitted to do that. That God, God has, there is a reason for Him to allow trials, to allow troubles, and to allow uh, thing, insurmountable problems and crises in your life. There's a reason for that. And um, I shared with you all uh, last week or two about from Romans 8 where where he talks about there that God will cause all things to work together for the good of those that love the Lord. And he, he mentions the reason for... He's, God's not the cause of all things, but He will cause whatever Satan throws at you to work together for good. He will cause it to work together for good. And he tells us the reason. It's to, it's to conform us to the image of His Son. It is the same principle with metals when you heat them up. Metal's heated up to get the dross to come to the top. And you don't know all the sins that you even have in your life until you're in trouble. And then the dross will come up. And it's a very, very nasty substance that comes to the top. And when you scrape that away, and that's what Jesus is here to do, is to take that dross away. If you will submit and not be rebellious, if you will accept that you're having this trial and it's yours to bear right now, and you'll say you'll you'll begin to ask God, what is it that you want me to learn? What why why am, is these things coming to my life? What is it you want? If you will sincerely ask, He'll show it to you. He'll show it to you in ways that you don't even believe that He will, but He'll show it to you. And so when you scrape away that dross, it doesn't matter what you're melting down, really, whether it's silver or lead or. I'm telling you, get a mirror finish and you can see yourself in it. Gold, it becomes just like a, a pure mirror that you can see. Well, that's what he's doing. He's trying to see the, his reflection of himself in you. 
And trials are used to do that. And that's why he uses such analogies as a refiner's fire in Scripture. Or that he uses the analogy of, of, a, of a potter being molded. And so what he'll do is he'll bring a terrible crisis into your life. And I know some of you know what I'm talking about. Where there's no way out except for doing the right thing. And in other words, you're at a place where only God can help you. And you know it. You're at a place where only God can help you. Nobody else can help you. And if you try to fix it yourself, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to get, come out worse. Because that's not what He wants you to do. He's not, as soon as you have a trial, He doesn't want you to cry out and cry out and cry out. Take it away. I don't want this. It's not what He's waiting to hear from you. He's waiting for you to ask, okay, what's up, God? What are, you, what are you teaching me here? He wants you to learn something. And there's never been any crisis brought into the life of anybody in the Bible that was not used to take away sin or to, to, to equip them for something He called them to do. He, he anointed David king of Israel. And he spent 15 years running for his life. And so he's, there's, a, there's equipping and there's learning. And there's learning to trust, rely upon God. There's things that we can only learn during trouble that he wants you to learn. Trust, rely upon him. And you know what? You may have a crisis like what Raymond has where you have to ask every day for a good day. You know what? You're relying upon him every day for that good day. And you know what? He's waiting for us to thank Him for those good ones and rely upon Him for those that we need. He's waiting for that. But I don't believe our crises are forever. And um, He's delaying His power for a reason. And for all of us, He's delaying His power for a reason. And we need to seek Him on what that reason is. And just one thing I'll tell you before we continue. If you want to know, I believe He'll show it to you. I really do. You have to become open to that He will answer you. He will show you something. Sometimes God just does things because He wants to. If He wants to tell you something, He'll just tell you. Sometimes He'll just do it. But others are made to wait, and most people are made to wait. But if you will consistently ask with, a, with an obedient heart and tell Him that you really want to learn the things that He wants you to know, or to understand, or to, to change about yourself, then I believe He'll show it to you. And so, this is the way we want to start this idea, is that Jesus said that there are things that are just impossible for you to take care of, but nothing's possible for God to do. Now, he, Jesus said that because He wanted you to know that it is possible for God to help you. And this is what I want to accomplish with this study. One of the things here is I want you to consider for a minute that God is still on the job and He will still help you. Okay? Alright, will God do the impossible for you? I want to talk to you a little bit about some things that, the, that, the Jesus, that God has been saying for years, for a very, very long time, from the beginning until now. And this is a verse that He, he spoke to us about. I took it from a modern version so that we could get the full benefit of what He's saying and uh, what he says is that when you did, when you did some awesome deeds that we, uh, that we, when you did awesome deeds that we expected, you came down and the mountain shuddered before you. Since ancient times no one has heard, nor ear has perceived, nor eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those that wait for him. Now listen, this is important because waiting is required, but we want to know that God will act on your behalf. And this, we're just saying, this is just what the Scriptures say. Okay, you come to the aid of those who gladly do what's right and to those who remember you in your ways. Now, this is important, too. And that, what I did is I took verse 4 and I took it from a different modern version. And what we're going to see, this is the God who worketh for him that waiteth for him. We're just showing that he'll work for you, he'll act for you, he'll act in your behalf. And this is just what we want to show the Scriptures is saying. So believing he can and will act on your behalf... It's going to be required. If you're just going to have a doctrine where i got to fix it myself, that Jesus just saved me and everything's on automatic, and I know that there are Christians that are not comfortable with anything else, but it's not true. 
you know. And I, th there's many problems in the church, especially legalist churches today, because they're afraid to believe. And uh, I think that that's one of the huge problems with prophecy. Uh, people want to shut the book and close it and put it in a little box and lock it up and nobody study it. Even though 90% of it is about Jesus' return. Something we know hasn't happened. I, mean, I challenge you to go through the book of Re Revelation and, and, and just count how many times it speaks of Jesus' return. Or His wrath that's poured out right before He returns. Or what happens after He returns. It's almost all the book. And they just want to shut it because they don't understand it. There's a lot of metaphors in it. And a lot of that stuff won't be understood until it's here upon us. And we say, oh, that's what that was. But, but in, because they can't control it, then they close it. And it's the same with faith. Because they can't control it, then they want to close it. See? They can't tell you what God's going to do or will do for you. And if they lay hands on you, you might not get better. But I can tell you from personal testimony that I have laid hands on people and they did get better. Some of them are in this room. Just putting that out there. Sometimes God does things that He says He'll do and sometimes the answer is wait. You know? And so I'm not saying that He's working... At this, his power is delayed for a reason. But sometimes there is something we need today that he'll take care of it for us. Okay? And so we're just pointing out as we look at these scriptures what we want to see from that. Believing he can and will act on your behalf, that's going to be required. And waiting may be required. We see that. See, he mentions that, uh, this, this old ideal, waiting, um, that is, is, is in that. So, so there may be something you have to learn before He will act in your behalf. And then we can also see right behavior is also required when He talks about those that do what's right and remember your ways. So just because He's not a genie in the bottle, and you're not going to rub your bottle and get God out of it to help you every time you're in trouble and then go back to your ways. But if, you, if you're in a crisis and you're willing to be faithful, to give Him your heart and to serve Him and to wait for help. I believe that, health is for, that help can be forthcoming. Okay, And you know, it may not be for everyone. I'm just saying that there are some people that love this world. And they get sick and they stay sick because He wants them to get ready to go home. Because this is not our home. And they need to let go. They need to change their affections from, from this world, which is the devil's kingdom, and set their affections on things above. So sometimes when it gets our time, that time may linger to get us ready to go home. See? Illness may linger for that very purpose. There are some people that may not get their heart right without an illness. I'm just putting that out there. Okay? Now, heaven has a message for people. And I want to just take you through something, uh, some things that Jesus said while He was here. And I want to point out some things specifically that he said. When, then the, when the disciples came to Jesus privately, they asked, why couldn't we force the demon out of the boy? And he told them, because you have so little faith. Now these are, these are people that he actually breathed on, sent them out to cast out devils until they came to this one. And nothing happened. So I'm just saying, God will let you fail, even, even in praying for people. He'll let you fail. These people failed in this particular incident. And so, because you have so little faith, he said, I guarantee you this truth. If your faith is the size of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, now this mountain's a metaphorical mountain, an obstacle. And, and this is really used first in Zechariah where they were trying to rebuild the temple. And he tells Zerubbabel, he said, that the mountain before you will become a plain. And he was referring to all the people that came together to stop them from rebuilding Jerusalem. And he said that mountain was going to become a plain. Well, it wasn't a real mountain. It was all the forces of hell that came against them to stop with something that God had said to do. And that's the way it is today. The forces of hell come against you to stop you. And anything that's going on in our lives, a lot of that right there is the devil. 
Illnesses are from the devil to stop you. Okay? And so there are some things that do come through. And you know, some of it may just be from our genes where our parents ate the fruit and all that death was written in the code. But I'm telling you that we know that when Jesus healed people, He spoke of those people who were oppressed to the devil and bound by Satan when He healed them. So it's very spiritual too. Okay? And that's all that I'm pointing out. And so he's talking about like, this kind of faith here that can remove obstacles. Now this is what I want to show you is that, that, is that in this particular instance, he told them to speak to the mountain. Okay? Whatever the obstacle is. So this is spiritual warfare. We're talking about the authority and the power in the name of Jesus and speaking to the mountain to remove it. So there's an attitude change, there's a faith change, and there's a focus change from, from the physical to the spiritual, when you realize that it's Satan that's your enemy and he's the forces, he's the forces that are coming against you. So all of our illnesses, all of that, that stuff that, is, is, that he's behind, okay? And God has allowed some things in our life for a reason. And he wants some results. And we need to figure out, with his help, what he wants from us. Okay? That's part of the relationship. And so, he said that nothing will be impossible for you with his help. Okay? And so, in Luke 1, verse 35 to 37, it says the angel was talking to Mary, and he said the Holy Spirit would come, on, come to her, and the power of the Most High would overshadow her, and therefore the Holy Child developing inside her would be called the Son of God. But something this angel said, he reminded her because she was having a crisis of faith while this angel was telling her all these things. Okay? She's like, don't I need a man for this? And so this is what the angel said. No, it's, it's going to be an act of God where you're going to be, become a, a woman with child. And he, as evidence, he said, Elizabeth, your relative, is six months pregnant with a son in her old age. People said she couldn't have a child. That said what everybody was saying. They'd made up their mind about it. But nothing is impossible with God. And so this is what the angel is telling Mary. Nothing's impossible with God. And... We're going to use Elizabeth for an example that God does what He wants. And just because you build a box for Him to operate in, He's not going to stay in the box. He's going to pop that box for you. Okay? And if you just want to resist Him when He pops a box, you just become His enemy. I mean, you're just working against what He's doing. Because you can't control what happened, and you, there are so many people that need to control what's happening. You know, to get everything in a nice, neat little package so they can be in charge of it. Um, I say the Holy Spirit's the policeman. And he can, he can run the church. He can be in charge of it. If we'll, if we'll trust God with His own church. Okay? So faith may be required, is all we're saying. Alright? God's plan and purpose. Now I want to just show you that this is the way He operates. He's got a plan and a purpose. Okay? In Romans 8, verse 25-34... He says that if we hope for that which we see not, then we with patience wait for it. And so he's talking about the idea of, of hoping for something and for waiting for something and needing help with something. And we're just pointing out those three words, okay? Because this is, this is life. You know, you have a hope, you, you're waiting, you need help, and, and this, is, this is life. This is what makes a relationship between man and God. And so he says, if we hope for that which we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. Now that's our weaknesses and our sicknesses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us. So this is what he's talking about. So you have this crisis come up and you're like, Oh God, take it away. I just can't handle it. I can't live with this. I can't deal with this. The Holy Spirit's going to flip that around. And he's going to say he don't know how to pray. And he's going to say, this is what he needs to learn, so let's help him learn this from this crisis. The Holy Spirit's going to flip it around, and he's going to make intercessions for what you need to become more Christ-like, what's going to bring you to the place where you're conforming to the image of his Son. Because I'm going to tell you something, he's already had a perfect world up there, and a third of his children rebelled. Okay? And they became his enemies. And so we got created in the devil's kingdom so we can learn to trust, rely and, uh, rely, and depend upon God for everything. He couldn't do that without enemies. 
So it don't always work out having everything perfect. There's some things you need to learn while you're down here. Okay? And so he's saying the Holy Spirit's going to flip that around. He's going to even take your groanings and your sighings, and he's going to interpret that. And he's going to search the hearts, and know the, he's going to know your mind. He's going to know the mind of God. And then he's going to, the Spirit, this is what the Spirit does. It searches hearts. And because he's going to make intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. This is what's important. When you said take it away, that wasn't God's will. God has a will for you. And we know what that will is. It's in this, it's in this, we're predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Crisis bring us to a place where we submit to God. And there are some things that, as we said before, you don't even know is wrong with you until you have a crisis. You have sins you don't even know you have. Problems that is, is really keeping you from being effective. Or if there's a particular calling that He has for you, He really can't send you into that calling with these problems that you have. And so that stuff has got to be brought to the surface. And the fires of trial is for the purpose of bringing that dross up. And so He's going to take, <clears throat> he's going to take all of these groanings and He's going to interpret them into a prayer that's according to God's will. Now this is what we know about that. Once a prayer is made for God's will, all of those are answered. Okay, so you may not, what you're asking for may not, may not happen. But what the Spirit is interpreting and praying according to the will of God, that will happen. He will bring that to pass. Because it's a prayer according to His will. All the prayers according to His will are answered. Okay, and if you want to know what that is, well, the Bible tells us what His will is. So you praying according to what the will is, all of those prayers are answered. All of them. Okay? And so, it says that we know that all things work together. And some modern versions say that God causes things to work together for the good of them that love God. So every problem we have is not from God. But they do come through His permissive shield. And all of us have a level of protection. I'm telling you that right now. If you didn't have a level of protection, you'd be dead instead of sitting here. You have a level of protection. Okay, And so he's saying that, that, that God will cause those things, whatever Satan throws at you, he will cause them uh, to work together for good. He will turn it to something good, to them who are called according to his purpose. So that this word purpose is sometimes translated plan. And so we're just showing that, that, uh, that he has a plan, and he tells us what the plan is, to conform to his name of his, the image of his Son. He wants us to become more Christ-like in this world, and the, I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can bring us to a place where Christ can live in us. He's the only one that can do that. And there's work to be done on you and with you. Okay? And so, this is just a modern version of verse 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those that love God, those whom He has called according to His plan. And so we're just pointing out, as, as, we, as we look at what we have here, that God intends to take whatever the enemy throws at you and to use it to conform you to the image of His Son. And those that love Him discover His plan and purpose. And that's all we're, we're pointing out is these verses actually talk about the plan and purpose of God and those that love God. Okay? There is a, there is a, a purpose. And he is, there's something that He's doing with us. Okay? Saving faith is tried. This is something else we need to consider, and glory follows. Well, you know, there's some things that God says about, about us that, that we really need to get in touch with. He talks about those that, that, that the justifying us um, and, um, and even glorifying us, you know. People get this backwards, perverted view of God where He just came down here so that we could all just be His little minions that glorify Him all the time. He, Jesus said he, he came down here and got nailed to a piece of wood to glorify you. And so there's something else to this that we need to see. That he has a plan, and his plan is good. And so um, when we look at this, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And so we, we have peace with God and even called his sons and daughters through Jesus, what Jesus did upon the cross and our faith in what he did. But then 1 Peter 1 verse 7 talks about it's not just any old kind of faith. It's the faith that, get, that gets tested. Your faith in God is going to get tested. It's going to be a tried faith that's going to make you this son and daughter of God. So the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though tried with fire. Though, and then we, again he's alluding to the ideal of, of this refinery process. Say, the trial of your faith, though it be tried with fire, might be found to praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And so that faith is going to get tested, and He'll give us a level of test that, 
that we can handle, we're sure to that. Some people get so rebellious because they don't want any kind of test at all. I'm just putting that out there. People get tested and they get angry at God because they got these things going on in their life. That's not the proper response. Okay, the proper response is to is to is to to give your heart to God, accept your trials, and to find out, to inquire Him, to tell Him you want to learn whatever He wants you to learn. Whatever you need to change about yourself, that you want to learn that. And that just to, to reveal it to you, and He'll reveal it to you. I'm just putting that out there. He'll reveal it to you. And it, it, it's, he's not, He doesn't get in a hurry about anything. There can be months go by before you get a clear understanding of why these things are happening in your life. And they could be years if, if he doesn't get the results that he wants. Okay? Years. Okay? And so, um, this is what he says. He also called those whom he had already appointed. He approved those whom he had called, and he gave glory to those whom he has approved of. This is a modern version too. You know, King James Version kind of sounds more past tense, but we're just pointing out that this is what we spoke of before, is that he proves of us that he's called. And he did that. He did that by Jesus paying the whole price for sin. Okay? But he's got a plan to glorify those that he's approved of. It's not all just trouble and crises. He's got a plan. This plan ends in, in God glorifying you. And so what can we say about all this? He goes on to say, if God be for us, who can be against us? Well, I'm going to tell you what's against you. All the, all the armies of hell is against you. Okay? But he's saying that they really can't accomplish anything as long as you trust God and have faith in Him and rely upon Jesus, your Redeemer. And so he's saying who... Who, what can we say about all this? If God be for us, who can be against us? God didn't spare His own Son. Now this is the evidence of, of who can be against you because of what God is willing to do. God didn't spare His own Son, but handing Him over to death for all of us, so He will also give us everything along with Him. Now did you hear that? He's letting you know in the New Testament that when He gave you His Son Jesus to die for your sins, He's not through giving. Don't build a box for him and say he won't give you anything. He's not through giving. He's saying if he'll give you his son, that proves he'll give you anything. And it's current. Okay? And so who will accuse those whom God has chosen? God's approved of them. It's Christ that died. He's saying Jesus already paid the debt so that God could approve of us. And we're not fixed. We got all kinds of problems. Rely upon the blood of Jesus every day. Needed applied to our hearts every day. We're not fixed. We're just approved of. Because Jesus redeemed us. And when He hung all day upon the cross, that gave Him the right to redeem. He didn't have any sins of His own. So whatever He did, whatever, he, whatever price He paid, it was for whoever He wills. Because He didn't have any sins of His own. And so He's saying that Christ died so we could be approved of, of God. And more importantly, it says he was brought back to life. And he has this highest position in heaven now. And now he's up there talking to God, interceding for us. So he gave us everything, and he's saying he will give us anything. And that's just what he says. Okay? So we can see here from verse 30 that we're justified by tried faith in God that gets approved of. Okay? This... this uh, he, this, this, we're talking about approval of people, okay? And so, everything the enemy does against us, God uses to help us to conform to the image of His Son. And that's what we see from this text, okay? He turns it to good, making a history with us so that we can have a confidence in His faithfulness in the future. So if we have a trial that goes as long as King David's, can, can you just imagine when he's running from Saul, acting like a crazy man one time, went in to, 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 to serve the, the king of the Philistines, his enemy, and was there at the bottom of the bucket, become a raider and a murderer and all kinds of things until he got in trouble. And then he called for the ephod. And you know what the Lord had for him next? The death of Saul and he was made king. Can you imagine? He was just a little boy when he got oil poured on his head. 
And he, he, when he came into Saul's tent, he thought, this has got to be it. It wasn't it. He had javelin thrown at him three times and, and ran for his life. Fifteen years later, he's king. But he was learning, being equipped to be king. He wasn't ready to be king. He had some things to learn. So he had this history with God, and that's why he could write like he wrote. Because of his history with God. And so if you have a trial that lasts 15 years, the day that it becomes over is the day you have a history with God. And you can write Psalms like he did about God's faithfulness. See? But the, I do believe that there is a day for our trials to end. I do believe that. Especially for the people in our time. There's a day, because we know time is short. Okay? And so we just want to point that out. God knows what He's going to do. Now we're about half done with this lesson. I just want to let you all know this is not a lot of slides. Teaching moment between God and man. I don't think that God is any different today than what He was the day that Jesus came down here for this teaching moment. All right? I just want to share this teaching moment with you. After these things, Jesus went over the sea to Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed Him because they saw the miracles which He did on them and them that were diseased. And Jesus went up to a mountain, and he sat with his disciples, and the past of the feast over the Jews was nigh. And when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw the great company coming to him, he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And I want, to, I want you to pay attention, because he's, he's, he's starting to bring a crisis into being. And he's God. <laughs> when is God in a crisis? So by this question, he's inventing a crisis. And he just wanted to know what they were going to do. And this said he to prove them because he himself knew what he would do. <laughs> that this is what you expect God to say, right? But he already knew what he was going to do. But I'm just, gonna, I'm just putting this out here that this is the real Jesus. He's going to bring you to a crisis and say, what now? <laughs> and he already knows what he's going to do before your crisis ever comes. He already knows. And that's just Jesus. That's who he is. So here Philip answered, well, this is how much money we got, right? We got 200 penny worth. But he said that the 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for all these people. That every one of them should have a little. Then one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, he said unto him, well, there's this lad here that has five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? So he's letting them work through it to see that they can't help themselves. Okay? And so... Uh, if, we, if I have learned anything about my Lord, it, it is He is a God of testing and He gives problems that only He can solve and then He watches us. That's what He does. And some of us have problems that only He can solve. Right now. Okay? So, a miracle that taught men with a purpose, a purposeful result. Now let's just look and see what happened. Jesus said, have the people sit down. And He said, there was plenty of grass for people to sit on. There were about 5,000 people in the crowd. And Jesus took the loaves and he gave thanks and he distributed to them and the people that were sitting there and he did the same with the fish and all the people ate as much as they wanted and when the people were full Jesus told his disciples gather the leftover pieces so that nothing's going to be wasted and the disciples gathered the leftover pieces of bread and filled 12 baskets and when the people saw the miracle Jesus performed they said this man is, a, is, is certainly the prophet who should come into the world. So what we're seeing is that God's love, compassion, and purpose that came together for results. He just watched them. But when they saw how much stuff was taken back up in the baskets and how little was handed out, they knew who this was. They knew who it was. And so He used the miracle to accomplish a purpose. His love, His compassion for the people. Uh, you know, if we, if we follow this story from, from putting the Gospels together, we'll see that they've been following Him for three days with nothing to eat. They hadn't had anything for three days. And so he didn't want to send them away fasting. Okay? So the test or teaching moments. Jesus uses a crisis where only he is able to help. He watches as they work through the problem. And they were, they were looking for solutions to their own efforts, ability, and resources. They counted the cost. They searched for resources among themselves. And Jesus used a no-name lad, didn't even give his name, to provide a little... But then he multiplied what he had through a miracle 
making the impossible possible. The teaching moment was to teach men to trust and rely on God for the things they cannot do without Him and to wait on the inexhaustible power and resources of God to help solve the crisis. And that's what happened here. Okay? My challenge is to you is to accept your crisis for now and ask the Lord to reveal His will to you in a crisis, for His will for you in this crisis that you're having to help you respond in the right way to the crisis and to help you understand what you're supposed to learn. And this is just where I'm at in my own life, is where I'm, I'm putting that to Him. And, um, and He lets me know. He shows me, he shows me what I'm supposed to learn. The record is true. Trust the record. Now what I want to do is in the next four slides, I just want to show you uh, from 1 John 5 some of the things that are, set, that are in just this context. Okay? Uh, believing the record and demonstrating, the faith love, demonstrating faith and love toward God. This is the love of God. This is verse 3. This is the love of God that, when we, that we keep His commandments. You remember how we started? Right behavior. Okay? Because there are some people that when they have a crisis, they're going to have wrong behavior. And a babe in Christ that has no root of himself, he's going to become a drunk. Or a dope head. Or whatever. Okay? He's not having the right... He, he, didn't, he didn't become obedient. He didn't ask for help to to be able to be obedient during his crisis. He just fell. He wasn't able to, de to deal. So whatever is born of God overcomes the world, he says. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. He's saying if you're going to overcome, it's going to be by your faith. Your faith and trust and reliance upon God. So who is he that overcometh the world but he that believes in Jesus, the Son of God? And this is the he that came by water and blood. In Jesus Christ, not by water only, but water and blood, and is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. So we got, we have got our faith, the Spirit's help, to help us overcome the world. Okay, and there he says there are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth: it is the Spirit, the water, and the blood. So we have cleansing, we have help, and the water and the Spirit. Okay? And these three are in agreement, he says. Our mission is to overcome the world. And the world is the devil's kingdom. And he has an, an innumerable company of angels himself, even with the third he took. Okay? And he, has, he uses all these forces to come against you. And if you can hear it, if you can hear it, he's created some of those forces. Because all we know that came from heaven was fallen angels. But we hear of demons and spirits and all kinds of things that are at his disposal now. So he was a powerful angel. Okay? And so he says here that, um, that the spirit, the water, and the blood are agency to help us. Okay? And the record is the solid foundation to give us God's words to have faith in. And that's all we're trying to do is create faith in a specific area of something that he said. All right? What is it? We're just going to continue to look. This is uh, the next verse. Verse 9 is uh, what is written that we may believe. It is so that we may believe. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which we have testified of His Son. And so they came testifying of His Son. That's the, this is the foundation of everything. And he that believeth on the Son hath the witness in himself. The witness is the Spirit of God. So we have the Spirit of God within ourselves. He, Jesus called Him a helper. Okay, He that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believeth not the record. Now this is important. He's saying that, that when, you, when you don't believe the record, then you're calling God a liar. And this record is primarily uh, that God gave of His Son, Jesus, who He was. And this, but there's other things in the record. This is the record that God hath given us eternal life. That's part of the record too. And this life is in His Son. That's part of the record too. He hath that, that he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. These things I've written unto you that you might believe on the name of the Son of God, and that ye might have, that ye might know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. He says that twice because it's really double important. He wants you to know that everything he give you is about is to get you to believe in Jesus. That's the focal point. But there's some other things that he wants you to know that believing in Jesus is going to give you eternal life. That when you're a follower of Jesus and have the Holy Spirit of God living within you, that you have eternal life. But he's going to turn this message to 
the help again. And I just want to show that to you as we wrap up this, this study. This is qualifiers for the impossible to be possible, and that's why we're looking at this chapter, okay? It says in verse uh, 14, and this is the confidence that we have. Listen, he's saying this is something that I want you to have confidence in. This is something he says we have confidence in this thing. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now a lot of the things you're asking are not his will. Especially when you're just asking for something to go away. For him to just fix something. Okay? There's something, there, there's a reason why these things have come through God's protective shields. And we've got to, we've got to get in touch with the reason. Now some of it will be, like we said, it's all to conform us to the image of his son. But he may have a target issue with each of us that we need, to, we need to discover what it is. Because obviously we, we're, we're a mess when we come to Him, and most of us stay a mess for a very long time when we're with Him. But He does want to grow us. He doesn't want to stay a babe in Christ forever. Okay, And so He's saying that whenever you hit the target, the target prayer, and it's His will, you're going to get what He... What, when you're praying in His will, He's going to answer that prayer. All the prayers that are in His will are going to be answered. He's going to hear you. And He says that we know that if He hears us, whatever we ask, we know we're going to have those petitions. So when you get in His will, it's going to be answered. Okay? And that's all that I'm just bringing to your attention. This is when the impossible comes possible, is when you stop asking for it to be taken away and start asking, okay, what, what do you want me to learn? And you become you humble yourself under His hand, like it says, in the scriptures, and you become moldable. Okay? If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for him that sin not unto death. And there is, there is a sin unto death. He just wants you to know that. And I think the Bible tells us what that is. I'm going to throw that in as we wrap it up. He says, All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. And we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. Now this is, this is one of the keys of the difference between the sin and the death and the sin not unto the death. He's saying you've got this person here that keeps himself. In other words, he never sins by permission. He has sinned. But he, he cannot permit himself to live with these sins because he's miserable. And so he has to try. And he has to know there's no space between him and God. Anytime we're allowing sin, there's space between us and God. And we feel it. And we can't bear space between ourselves and God when we love God. Okay? And so he said, This person keeps himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. Even though he's able to hurt him, he doesn't touch him. He's not able to make him fall. And he says, And we know that we are of God in the whole world of life and wickedness. So this is where we live, the devil's kingdom. And we know that the, that the Son of God has come that, and have given us an under, understanding that we may know Him. Now this is the relationship that we can't stand to have space between us and God. We may know Him that is true, and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son Jesus Christ, the true God and eternal life. Now look, I just want to point out a verse that talks about the sin unto death. It's Romans 6 verse 16. Know ye not that whosoever ye yield yourself servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. This is a second reference to the sin and the death. And we can see from the context that there's a difference between servitude to sin, and this is what he's saying, your servants to whom you're obeying. You, you've allowed the sin in your life, and you don't want to remove it. You like it. So you become a servant to that sin. And that's a sin unto death. And that is just stands in the contrast to something that we mess up on, and that's forgiveness for, like it's talked about in 1 John 1, verse you know, 5 through 10, where he just says that, you know, that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So we're walking proves we're trying, we're following. That, and, they, and he speaks there that if we say we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves. But, if, but for whatever sins that, uh, that, that we confess, he, can, he, he cleanses of, us of all unrighteousness. And so that's the sins we know and the sins we don't know. And so we, we're walking in the light. That shows effort and trying and, and not being permissive. While this sin and the death here is we're just going to allow this sin in our life. We know God don't want us to do it, but we're going to be a servant to it. You know? And I, I do see alcohol as one of those sins. Become a servant to it. Even become addicted to it. Instead of relying upon God and getting the help you need to, uh, to be delivered. Or instead of learning something. 
then you just want to try to escape it. Saying you're just telling God, I don't want to learn anything. Okay? So, this is the last slide, and I just want to show you two things. If you're going to look up the word impossible, I think you'll probably find these two places. I'm not sure they're the only two places. I can't really remember. I said I did this lesson three months ago. But it says that there are two immutable things. That's unchangeable things. Hebrews 6 verse 18. It's impossible for God to lie. That's one thing. It's impossible for God to lie. Everything we saw here today is true. If we saw it in the scriptures and we understood it correctly, then it's true. And the second thing is without faith it's impossible to please Him. That's what's impossible. Everything else is possible for God. And so faith is going to actually come down to this, us believing Him and having faith in Him who He is and uh, what He says. And that because of who He is, He'll do what He says He'll do. Okay? And that's what I want to leave you with as we wrap up this, um, this study today. I'll turn it back over to the brother in charge.